Hey friends, I'm Optimistic Duelist, and this is Homestuck Explained. In today's episode, we're going to talk about Homestuck's alchemy system, and how it reveals the philosophical backbone of Homestuck's universe. Before we can talk about the Heavenly Machina, we need to talk about Homestuck's inventory system, the Scylla Dex. Each character in Homestuck has a unique UI for managing their inventory, which in the stories universe fills the same role as extremely efficient backpacks. Obviously, this is a parody of adventure game inventory systems, but Homestuck also uses the system to teach the audience about computer design logic. The end effect of this system is that the characters in Homestuck largely interact with their environment based on computing logic, not physical logic. When managing their possessions, the characters are dealing not with physical objects, but with data. Each player's Scylladex is made up of sets of capture log cards that are perfectly blank. When you put an item inside a capsule card, a literal capsule appears on the back of it, identifying the contents within. We'll come back to this. First, let's get that tutorial out of the way, though. The first time you use the Heavenly Machina, you're likely to be running out of time. This is the collective name given to the machines the server player deploys at the beginning of the game, and the machines they continue to unlock as they progress through the game. The items players receive during this tutorial are... A pre-punched card with an item printed on it. The Cruxtruder, which generates a cylindrical block of raw material called a Cruxite Dowel. The Totem Lathe, which you can insert the pre-punched card and the Cruxite Dowel into. Doing this will have the lathe carve a Cruxite Totem. And finally, an Alchemeter, which scans the Cruxite Totem the player creates and then generates the item punched into it. The item that results is called a Cruxite Artifact. Technically, for most alchemy, there's one more step. After completing the tutorial, you unlock the Punch Design X, which allows you to punch your own cards in the same manner as the pre-punched card the game gives you. This allows you to essentially create new copies of any item in your possession. Punch a couple of different items and then combine the punched hole patterns in different ways, and the system allows you to create combinations of those items on the conceptual level. Once you've figured out these mechanics, then presto bingo! A few easy steps and you instantly created something. But hold on, isn't there something off here? Alchemy, as it's culturally understood, is typically based on the idea of the transmutation of matter. There's an expectation of equivalent exchange built into the idea. Full Metal Alchemist made sure we all grew up knowing that. But on first glance, Spurb's alchemy system would seem broken. You use Grist in order to make items in Spurb, but the item's size and mass don't correlate to the item's Grist cost. Making smaller or bigger versions of the same item scales the amount of Grist you use, but some items much smaller than others can come at a much higher higher cost, and the activity that creates the most mass, building upwards, uses up the least amount of grist. Where did the materials to produce the item you're holding come from? If they didn't come from anywhere, doesn't that mean you just created something out of nothing? That's as stupid as it is impossible. The math behind this alchemy makes no sense at all. But maybe there's a different way of thinking about this. What were the machines used to make this alchemy possible called again? The Heavenly Machina? And what's the end product created by this process? A Crooksite Artifact. While an artifact is a physical object, note that it's specifically an object that reflects culture or history in some way. We can find hardier material to flesh out our understanding of this system with by taking a look at the game abstraction used to create the items in the first place, Grist, which is defined as a useful material especially to back up an argument. And so there you have it. Homestuck's alchemy system is based not on combining physical materials, but on combining elements of thought. In doing this, Homestuck establishes itself as being firmly grounded in Greek philosopher Plato's theory of forms. This theory essentially states that there are two versions of the world. There's the material world, the physical space we know as reality. But inside the mind, within the realms of the imagination, there is an entire version of the universe boiled down to its barest essence. When you think about a particular idea in your imagination, you always imagine the most perfect form of that thing imaginable, the purest, most basic expression of that idea. For example, when you try to visualize the concept of a fruit, you're likely to think of an apple. For some reason, at least in our Western society, we've all just sort of internalized the idea that the common denominator of fruits is an apple, to the point that the word apple itself is derived from the Old English word that simply described fruit. And when you imagine an apple, you're likely to imagine a perfect, pristine apple. 
An apple that's cut into pieces or misshapen in some way is a subvariant of an apple, an apple with modifiers placed onto it. In that same way, most fruits are likely to come to your imagination as basically apples, but with a twist, a different color or a slightly different shape or whatever. Sort of like an apple, but also kind of its own thing, you know? This experience of identifying core ideas about reality, like an apple or a perfect circle or a horse, and then branching into subvariants of that idea, experiencing it through the multitude of different versions of it that can exist in the material world, is what Homestead's alchemy system is based on. Grist is a material used to literally give substance to an idea a character holds inside their heads, and the more complicated that idea is, the more grist it costs. Essentially, Homestuck's alchemy system reveals that its fundamental reality is a sort of sham. That if you think the right way and have the right tech gadgets, you can essentially tell physics to go fuck itself and take all the work out of making anything you could ever think to want. Once they discover it, the characters exploit this advantage for everything it can offer. Unhindered by any limitations between having ideas about how to navigate their realities and being able to act on those ideas, they quickly begin creating objects imbued with ideas that blur the line between science fiction and magic. They also exploit it for simple fun. The characters continually find ways to playfully demonstrate their identities and show the reader and other characters what they're about. This plays into their weapons, as each character only uses upgraded versions of what they're already most comfortable with. It changes how they use computers as they begin making styles of computing that are so convenient and powerful they begin to blur the line between science fiction and fantasy. These computers actually manage to keep feeling like computers, thanks to clever touches that imply that they simply prefer the UIs and systems of information that they're most comfortable with. Hell, they each have different browsers and argue about what browser is better based on arbitrary qualities and their personal taste and preferences. They use the internet exactly like we do, only better. But maybe the most important way they use this newfound ability to make thought manifest isn't in weapons or utility, but in how they employ fashion. I've already described a bunch of little ways personal aesthetic comes into the kids' choices, but it's important to understand that it really is built into pretty much everything the players make. Fashion is about self-expression. It's an art form like any others, it's just that with fashion, the art is molded around the idea of who you are, in that the art curves around your skin and becomes part of how people see you. And the kids never miss an opportunity to let us know who they are and what they value. They're always telling us about themselves through their senses of color and aesthetic, as well as their styles of clothing. But by this point, if you're anything like me, you might be starting to feel like this is a little self-indulgent. I mean, isn't this all kind of extravagant? Isn't wasting resources on personal identity kind of frivolous when you're dealing with creating an entire universe? Maybe even sort of greedy? Doesn't it speak to a sense of childlike arrogance on the part of the characters that they think they can win while also wasting a lot of time and resources making all this stupid shit? Isn't all this kind of obnoxious? Self-absorbed? Wrong? Maybe even sinful? In our next video, we'll talk about the first items the kids actually make, the Crooksite artifacts. Specifically, the first one, John's apple. I was kind of flippant about it earlier, but you know, there is a reason we think of an apple as the most basic version of a fruit. It's all down to a cultural belief we've all been exposed to. A common denominator that we're all at least aware of, that ties us all together in a single culture. A particular kind of story. On this episode, we watched our heroes bite from the fruit of knowledge. In the next, we'll find out what that means for them. If you like what I'm doing here and you want to see more of it, feel free to support me on Patreon. Doing so seriously helps me out and gets you access to cool perks, including access to the Discord server where the concepts for these videos are threaded together from the hairs of 10,000 gay wizard beards. You can also find me on the official Archive Swap Reddit and Discord. See you again soon, everyone. Keep rising.